gentlemen and gentle, or even more gentle women. We welcome you this evening to the Book of Mormon Perspectives Forum. I am pleased that uh, when we review these uh, presentations, we get, get a chance to give people five to 10 minutes to, to give us a review. And, uh, and we try to take advantage of that to make it so that people who missed the actual presentation can, can come back in on the review and also hopefully we will ask you questions, get comments in. And while Kyle Walker has indicated he will not be available this evening, he's the only one that indicated that. So I hope that the others will show. But at this point, I only see Blair and uh, Chris and myself. So I um, we'll hope the others show up. Um, because it is a review session, and we built this on the premise that at the end of any, any, uh, archaeological season, we like to lay out the artifacts on the table and have people come take a look and see just what they can see. Because different eyes looking at the uh, same issues often will generate different conclusions or even different approaches as to how to approach, how to address. And so to be able to give ourselves a chance to lay out on the table what we've heard over the last uh, eight weeks and give you a chance to interrelate those and see what we're learning. Um, I think it's useful for us to do that and before this evening is that review session. We do in the uh, in the coming week we have uh Lord Sandbury coming next next Monday. Eric is the author of the of the book about the uh Campaign of Joseph Smith Jr. in 1844, and he his uh, doctoral research uh, led him to identify 611 people that were out uh, in the country campaigning for him. And then Bill Shepard is coming on the 21st to uh, share with us about the early Mormon apostles. And then James Lucas uh, on the Zionic aspect of the New Mormon. The third and fourth Levi, with emphasis on economic, social, and political analysis. And then we have a gap on the uh, on September 4 date. Casey Griffiths is scheduled on September 11. So we're still looking for other people for other presentations, but as it's always been working out, uh, people keep volunteering. And so here we are now in the third, again, it's like the third year of Open Moment Perspectives Forum. And I welcome you. Some of you have been with us throughout, and I really appreciate that. Some of you are comparative newcomers, and appreciate that too. For if I recall correctly, when Robin Cook last told me about the number of people that were getting the invitations, I think it was something over 220. So even though we only have maybe 40 people or 40 flat screens open on a given evening, the um, variations of presentations and interest of the people continues to increase to me, and I thank you. And ask uh, for questions. Let us pray. Robert, you turn the slide. Robert, can we take the second slide on, please? Uh, okay, it's on my computer. Can you see this, the second slide, Deb? Oops, I'm seeing Blair Bryant, the Old Testament in China. I'm seeing basically the thing. I'm not seeing the second one. It's off to the uh, side. Yep, hang on a second. How about now? There you go. I see a baby in a car carrier. Is that the one you want, Paul? Let us pray. Your God called you here because we feel you near. Yet we look at your awesome creation, colliding galaxies cause us to fear. Yet we see a baby and delight in the opportunity to hope to create. And we see the Milky Way with our little Earth face trouble to comprehend. You are so great. Bob, 
we look around us and see so much to appreciate. Flowers, birds, seasons, microscopic things with which we must learn to interrelate. And yet you address us in familiarity. You call us by name. You give us significance. And we fear we give you shame. But we find it difficult to rise to your standard of virtue. To be patient, kind, caring, understanding, loving, always true. And this evening, dear Lord, on our perspective forum, allow your spirit to attend, to bless presenters and participants with growing understanding, our misunderstanding to amend. And help us grasp more fully your intent, your purpose in us, your perspicacity, that we embrace your virtues up to and beyond our moral capacity. And we too would like to qualify as needed, representing the loving closeness we feel when we can feel you are near. We pray in the name of Jesus, your Son, the expression of you most clear. Amen. All right, in our review this evening, I'd like to have us begin with. with uh, Chris Thomas, uh, we had the uh, curious situation that uh, might call him away. And so let's let him begin and then Blair and uh, hopefully other people that their schedule will come in. If not, then may just be the three of us tonight. Chris, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Paul. And, and thanks for the return invitation. Deb, I passed through. Townsend today, driving over to Gatlinburg, and was thinking about your upcoming race. Um, I appreciate the chance to talk about uh, my my nerdy interests uh, in terms of the Book of Mormon, and the uh, presentation I made uh, a bit ago about punctuation or capitalization. Uh, just to briefly recap. Um, I was doing some research on fourth Nephi and the way I wanted to start the research, I mean, I had, in, what I had in mind was, uh, what would a, a critical commentary on the Book of Mormon look like? Um, I deal with lots of critical commentaries on the New Testament and I thought, well, if we were going to do such a thing, and fourth Nephi seemed to be of sufficient length for me to get a start, uh, where would we start? And one of the places would be to start with the text itself. And so uh, under normal circumstances, that would mean identifying the primary texts that that particular book appears in. And of course, fourth Nephi appears in the printer's manuscript, but not in the original manuscript, as most all of you know. But as I, I looked in some detail at the printer's manuscript, what I observed was the way the word disciple or disciples, plural, uh, was capitalized in fourth Nephi. And that made me wonder as to the practice of whether disciple or disciples was capitalized elsewhere. So I, I initially compared uh, the practice there in, in, in the printer's manuscript with the original manuscript, but alas, it did not exist for fourth Nephi. But in the places earlier, the three places earlier in the original manuscript, um, disciple was always capitalized. And so then I began to look at the pattern of capitalization on the word disciple or disciples in the rest of the printer's manuscript and discovered that the first several occurrences, uh, nearly all of which were in the hand of uh, Oliver, were capitalized. But at a certain point, when Oliver would, would copy, 
uh, they would be that the word would be in lowercase. And then when scribe two took up the pen, they would all be capped. And then when Oliver took back up the pen, they would be lowercase. So it, it was it struck me as a really odd kind of um, phenomenon that exceeded kind of one-off changes. And so what I eventually uh, proposed was that what I think may have happened is that in the original manuscript, I'm proposing or I'm thinking that disciple was always capitalized, but that somewhere in the um, setting of the 1830 text uh, by the printer, that disciple was treated as a common noun, not a proper noun. And that when Oliver, who seems to have been the primary proofreader, uh, discovered that, that he changed his copying of the original end of the printer's manuscript and followed what he saw being laid out in the 1830, what would become the 1830 edition. But that scribe too continued to uh, replicate the original manuscript. And um, uh, having the interests that I have, I then wondered what might be at stake theologically um, in terms of if the 1830 edition had always capitalized the word disciple or disciples, would that not theologically have the effect on the readers of um, heightening the understanding of the word disciple and what disciples mean? So for me, I, I work with kind of product end of um, the Book of Mormon, not the production end. And I think a couple of folk, and I'd, I'd wondered myself if the whole disciples movement might have played some role, but I'm more interested in the readers that one could construct out of the text itself. And so if disciple were being uh, capitalized, almost replicating how apostle uh, was used in the printer's manuscript, would that have made a theological difference to readers of the Book of Mormon? To me as a reader, as an outsider, I think it would have elevated my understanding of disciples and discipleship um, in ways that the current practice in the 1830 edition did not. And so it's, it's a very, very uh, modest kind of study and proposal, but that I think Paul in a nutshell is what my presentation was about. And it's so fascinating to me that uh, the disciples of Christ and clearly there's a there's a natural inclination to want to capitalize, to elevate, as you suggest. And I, I'm intrigued by our use of apostles because I think you pointed out that, uh, in your presentation that with the LDS, the, the apostles are perceived quite differently from the way they are in the community of Christ. And um, I I think that, well, I don't know, don't know if the LDS necessarily capitalize their apostles, but I think they hold them in very high regard, whereas for the community of Christ, they're common ordinary people. So anyway, so the, the whole theological issue there of, of, of the importance of how to capitalize when we're looking at the nouns that are common or, or um, the proper nouns, that, that, that's a fascinating discussion. I thank you so much for that. Let's, uh, let's invite Blair to share his uh, uh, review and 
And so I'll get mine in, and then if they have any others come in, fine. If not, then we'll be open for discussion. Blair? I don't unmute. Um, Chris, are you going to be around for a while to answer questions? I'm going to do my best, Blair. Okay, because I have some questions to ask of you on that. Okay. Uh, but uh, uh, they apparently want me to go on and give my presentation here. Indeed. Um, I'll come back to the, your questions later. <laughs> okay. Wait a minute. I've uh, got my program up here, but I haven't shared the screen. Genesis. Is it? Well, I thought I had this all worked out, Deb, but I don't. <laughs> um, I've got to escape out of it somehow and get back to Zoom. No. Uh, we won't go into why this. I, are you hearing anything? No. Yeah, we heard a bit of background, and then, then we heard your voice. Yeah, well, I want to show the the slides here, and I got to share my screen first, and I don't know how to get out of the. I'm I'm going to uh, cancel out. Close your file first. That's what I'm trying to do is close the file. You, do you see the little X in the right hand corner up at the top? I know how to close the file. It just uh, I've got some action going on with my PowerPoint closing. Good. Uh, okay, now I'm back. Uh, I need to share my screen. Now I got to call up my PowerPoint again. <laughs> Thought I had all this done. Let me welcome Rick Bennett in. Good evening, sir. And I think that's David Clark joining us. And John Mueller and Lori Long and David Job. James Lucas have jumped in since I got to deep in the first place. Welcome, everyone. It's especially gratifying to have those of you that have presented previously come back and and uh, have a chance to, to participate in the Q&A with other presenters, I, I I think we all particularly appreciate that. This book does not show. Well, I'm still having trouble. Uh, suppose you ne let the next presenter go while I try and figure out what my problem is. <laughs> all right, uh, in that case then, Robert. Oh. Let's go back to the Blair. 
Glenn, would you like to <clears throat> email me your pow <clears throat> excuse me your PowerPoint, and then if worst case, uh, I could share it. <laughs> email you my PowerPoint. Okay, but suppose in the interest of time, you move on to the next presenter and uh, I'll do that. But that'll take me a bit to get, get to my uh, email. I've got to get out. <laughs> I don't want to lose Zoom. <laughs> okay. Robert, if we can go back to my first slide, let me just review those presentations that uh, we would have had if the, if the presenters had been available. And I think uh, Jim Britt would be the first one on that list. Yes, go back to the top, please. Now, Blair is still working on pulling his up, so we'll be able to, to share it. Jim Britt uh, gave us a presentation on what he saw as the American covenant relations in the Book of Mormon. And uh, it was rather an unusual kind of presentation because he's rather an unusual kind of a person, but uh, he wanted to give special emphasis to covenant relations. I find that uh, consonant with the LDS position that uh, the temple is a covenant, uh, a place where the covenants are made, and so they do give that a good deal of emphasis that uh, others in the Restoration Movement who do not uh, celebrate the temple so much are not so interested in. So it appears to me that the covenant relations with the Book of Mormon in America are um, much more likely to be addressed by the LDS than the other members of the Restoration Movement. John Charles Duffy prepared the celebration of the, yeah, I don't want to call it the celebration of the assassination, um, but basically that's what it is, uh, Joseph and Iris Smith on June 27th at Nauru. And his uh, presentation was about the details of how you prepare a celebration of the Book of Mormon, because he put the focus on the Book of Mormon this year and it allowed for him to pull up hymns that that uh, we're Book of Mormon addressing, and and so he, having participated in that uh, in that uh, event, I can very much appreciate that what he has done there is uh, a detailed kind of preparation that most of us would not want to undertake. And Chris has already presented his. Kyle Walker uh, presented on William Smith for the Book of Mormon, and uh, Kyle's also done a couple of other books about. Um, Joseph Sr. and Lucy, and uh, he has one coming out that I'm anxious to see about, uh, let's see, I think it was not about Sophronia, the other daughter, somebody help me out. Anyway, <clears throat> he has another, he, he's done more detailed study of the, of the Joseph Sr. family than most anybody else. And then I'll be talking about the thinking skills, but actually I want to retitle that uh, um, and make it pondering, uh, to ponder these things in your heart. I think pondering is the topic that I'd like to have because I no Gunlock kind of challenge whether my topic had anything to do with the Book of Mormon. And by using the quote about, uh, from Moroni about ponder these things in your heart, then uh, that gives him that tie that I think is more emphasis to. Mara Hathaway on her Delmarva Delmar presentation uh, pleased and I think shocked a bunch of us with the recognition that the Chesapeake geography could be made to, to illustrate the Book of Mormon, and particularly because she was able to draw in the uh, Hukamora at the north end of that uh, geography that, it, that uh, has a nice convergence with the Heartland theory. But uh, the fact that she was looking at Chesapeake geography and, and seeing the difference between the the elevated spaces and the lowlands um, 
is a very interesting and significant fact. And the fact that she had a very small geographical location compared to many of the others um, made it um, particularly intriguing to me because uh, when you're talking about people on foot, then to be able to, to uh, put her in a hikeable area like that is, uh, is of uh, value. All right, Robert, let's go down to the next slide that um, will speak, I think, of Andre. There, Andre the Arts. Isaiah, you, you recall that we had the earlier presentation from from uh, Jonathan Neville about uh, the rational, uh, rationality of the, of the restoration. And he cited the Isaiah scripture, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Well, I like that, and I also called to his attention that the Doctrine and Covenants 162 says, reason together in love and the spirit of truth will prevail. And so that, uh, that set of bookmarks sets up a very interesting combination, I think. What does it mean for us to be reasoning together? When we reason together, clearly that's a set of thinking skills. And so I got distracted because Norman Coulter had put together a beautiful book about the five modes of thinking, which I've used throughout my teaching career. And so I wanted to present that and give you a chance to, to look at the overall picture. And I would highlight that the modes of thinking that we use they, they either limit or encourage our reasoning together. And because I think many of us uh, we limit ourselves to lower modes of thinking, then we therefore miss out on some of the best prospects for Zionic thinking. But when we do reason together in love with compassion, we can find mutually en enhancing solutions. And when we generously join forces with compassionate people around the world, we really can promote the restoration tradition of Zion even though we may have to do it in other people's terms. Next slide. The ba most basic mode that uh, Norman Coulter identified in his 1976 book on synergetics is one that uh, is fundamentally question free. It's the one where we see the sunrise, we see the sunset. We don't ask any questions about them. We accept our perception as reality. And even though we have known for 400 years that the sun does not rise nor set, we still sing about it and we still perceive it that way because it is so fundamental to our perception of ourselves. But it is the mode that's used in, in hypnosis and also in magical thinking. And it's consistent with the, what Third Nephi tells us, take no thought for your life, or you shall eat or you shall drink. But be like the flowers, the Lord takes care of everyone, takes care of everything. And so when we trust in the Lord, then that's the most fundamental thing. Next slide. This is the reactive mode, the one that is simply either or. And it's the one that has the basic emotions in it. Um, because we are right, and they therefore must be wrong. And we're able to justify our uh, superiority and other people's inferiority, and therefore justify war. The lawyer is trained to use this mode to entrap people, and so the question is, whether you have stopped beating your spouse or children yet, means that any way you answer, you're going to get in trouble. And Alma identifies that same process. There were some among them who thought they to question them that by their cutting devices, they might catch them in their words. And so the Amalek rebuked the lawyers. Uh, there, there are some fundamental uh, good elements in this because it does provide for us a chance to work out our fundamental morality. But because we use it so often to simplify our, and justify ourselves and therefore otherwise other, the other people, makes it a, a rather dangerous one. It's so very commonly used that I want to warn you that, that I think that they have better, better uh, modes to use than they should be when we do them. Next slide, please. The, the, the musket there is one of the uh, Harper's Ferry's muskets that we. The, the, the kind that was used in the Battle of Nauvoo. All right, the uh, third mode is the multiple option mode. And politicians are particularly good at this because they will provide alternatives, but they will tell you that the alternative they represent is, of course, the best one, the one that you should vote for. 
and so it tends to dominate the public sphere where multiple options may be available. But uh, the political parties try to clarify the good and the bad options for us and tell us which one is most correct. So the sequence that I put over on the side comes from the little teacher in me, um, which is the most correct. Well, you'll notice that the sun also rises according to Hemingway. The cosmos, cosmos does continue to change. Solar system provides really up orbit so the Earth and the Moon. And it's perception for yourself at the center of the universe, merit to reconsideration. So they're all correct. You know, which one's the most correct? Well, you have to determine that on the basis of who is the teacher, what, uh, what the person reading the paper thinks. Next picture, please. The fourth mode is the multi ordinal mode. And there we add perspective. It's interesting that you'll find that term in our book of Modern Perspectives Forum. But the options are studied from various perspectives and we research to gather data to inform our decisions. Unfortunately, in this mode, more research is always needed. So educated people keep practicing in this mode and, and, and they get swamped by all of the data. So I'm sitting here with uh, responsibility for, for telling the story of something close to a half million artifacts in the basement of the red brick store. And uh, the more I write, the more the, the more the authors tell me nobody wants to read a thousand page book. So uh, we get the, you know, we tend to get swamped in this research category. But this category incorporates uh, good reasoning and focus upon an objective. And um, it does provide the, the basic mode of thinking that we're trying to encourage people to in the universities. Next slide, please. The fifth mode that, um, that Coulter identified is the synergic mode. And I particularly want to call this into your attention because it focuses upon solutions and it uses all the early, earlier modes, particularly emphasizing the, uh, the options and the perspective, but it seeks solutions that are, that are beneficial to all concerned. And so the question of how can this situation be addressed compassionately, generously? What options move us, move us toward a mutually enhancing solution? And this mode then is the one that I believe is needed for Zion and the one that the scriptures are promoting when they say ponder in your heart. That ponder in your heart then is a point that I'll get to on the next slide, but I, I, I think that is highly significant because when we ponder in our heart, we have to combine our best reasoning and our best sensitivity. So it is an associative generative searching for an acceptable answer. Of course, the action more interested in generous possibilities than the narrow probabilities that we tend to see when we're in the uh, scholastic mode. Um, Edwin de Bono's lateral thinking emphasizes that we often get ourselves thinking in a rut. And because we're thinking in a rut, then, then until we can move laterally, getting outside the rut, then we're stuck. We can't think of anything because all we can see around us is just the options that we have. And so now we've got to raise ourselves up and, and move ourselves to the side in order to be able to think of uh, better options. And I think that is an appropriate characteristic because much of our society, much of our thinking, I think, tends to be on those lower levels. I spent a week teaching chess and thinking skills at, um, at, at Grayson and then the uh, object I tried to emphasize how many moves ahead are you thinking? On the chessboard, unless you're thinking of moves ahead, then you're not likely to win. The same is true in life. And so how many moves ahead are we thinking? How, how far ahead are we thinking in terms of being able to implement the cause of Zion? But for us to think synergically means that we're going to be working together. And Second Nephi tells us the Lord of Hosts hath sworn saying, Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. For our thinking, then our conversations about it, and then our action to implement, bring, upon, bring to pass the synergic ideas that can be mutually enhancing and beneficial to all concerned. Next slide, please. Well, that was, a, uh, I wanted to, to highlight that was a pondering picture. I, I grew up on a farm where we had several ponds. So for me to go over pondering, usually meant with a fishing pole. And with that fishing pole, then 
get to ponder not only what, what you see on the surface, but also what's underneath and where are those fish. And while that's a rough analogy, perhaps I, I want to give it some emphasis here because on the surface level, reflections on the pond tend to serve as a mirror, although we are looking at others instead of ourselves typically. But uh, then just below the surface, there's a warm zone. And after you've been out from the hay field, you're all covered with the uh, chaff and you come to strip off your clothes and dive in the pond on an August day like this. The top couple of feet will be warm. And you dive in, and, and as you go down, then you get out of the cool zone, and, and it's so refreshing to go through the upper heat, then the warm water, and then down into cool water, and then come back up into warm water and breathe. The, uh, the, 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 there is a, an opportunity to do some interesting pondering here. Um, that warm zone, as the water cools, will kick up the water vapor, and uh, that cooler zone down the pond, down in the pond, tends to shelter the fish, and yet they will often come up to his, to the uh, warmer zone along the surface to feed on the gas hoppers and the tadpoles and worms and so forth. At the bottom, they're commonly mud banks or sometimes in the pond will have stone lining, but um, there'll be bottom feeding fish and turtles and caught adders that are a wealth of life uh, at that uh, in that muck. And I want to emphasize that people ponder at all of the, uh, the modes of think of levels, from all of the levels of the pond and all the levels of Okriki. But because we stand above when looking at the pond, we, we tend to be content with the surface mirror reflections, and they tend to do dominate our thinking. So it tends to put us back on the lower modes again. And when we can tie our mental acuity to the deepest sensitivities of our hearts, that I believe is the scriptural intent for ponder in your heart. To actually be able to do that, to, to work out the, the, the specifics, the skills by which to ponder in our heart is I think a, a call to Zion. One more slide, please. I also wanted to highlight that uh, that uh, I see the Charter for Compassion as, a, as something to be encouraged here because the Charter for Compassion has begun to spread across the world and the idea of getting people in various uh, communities, churches, businesses, individuals, groups, uh, clubs, um, towns to uh, claim to be compassionate and therefore to interconnect with other people, other businesses, other churches that are also willing to accept the compassion idea. Compassion idea is very centrally located at the golden rule. So therefore it's a universal. And for us to appreciate the principle of compassion, which lies at the heart of all religious, ethical and spiritual traditions, calling us to treat all others as you wish to be treated. That compassion impels us to work toward alleviating the suffering of our fellow creatures, to dethrone ourselves from the center of our world and put others there, to honor the inviolable sanctity of every single human being, treating everybody without exception with justice, equity, and respect. That's the first part of the Charter for Compassion. And while there's three more pages to it, I did not include those in my summation because I, I felt that this was enough to call to your attention that if we or when we get people thinking together, pondering in our hearts, looking with compassion at each other, looking to see what we can do to move ourselves away from the lowest levels of thinking to the higher levels, then I think we have a much greater opportunity to uh, build our perspectives into a biotic relationship. That's my summation. All right, Blair, I think we're ready to go back to you. Okay, did you get my email, Robert? I got your email, but I'm having trouble getting it downloaded. Um, 
time. Some I think you put it in a Google Drive, did you? Yeah, it was too big to send in an ordinary email. That was a yeah, message yeah. I got. Yeah, yeah. So as of the moment, let me double check again. I, it's still um, working on it in the Google Drive, and I can't download it yet. So. Larry, then you may want to go to ask him the questions you had for, for Chris. Okay, well, let me ask Chris a question. <laughs> um, I'm a kind of a nerd too, Chris. I, uh, nice to meet you. I think you had a wonderful adventure in your structural analysis of the written word, and and I thank you because I'm kind of a nerd like that too. Unfortunately, when you first made your presentation, I wasn't there to get in on the live part of it until after you had made your presentation and you guys were discussing it. So I couldn't uh, ask a question at that time. Uh, but I've now re reviewed your recording and uh, would like to uh, make a few comments. Um, first, in that day and age, uh, in my experience from studying the manuscripts, uh, it wasn't all that important to them whether they capitalized a, a noun or not. Um, yeah, a given scribe may have a, a pattern of um, uh, using a particular approach, and I I, I think you probably were dead on with the way that Oliver Cowdery found that after all these pages that had been printed, uh, it had been one way and that isn't what he had intended, but then he followed that and the other guy didn't get the memo. <laughs> right. Um, I think that's probably so. But in the earliest manuscripts, both the original and the printers, capitalization of proper nouns was not viewed as being a problem. Uh, that was customarily taken care of by the typesetter or the printer editor. In this case, it was probably by Grandin. Um, Oliver Cowdery may have played a part in that at some times, but um, I, I think probably it was Grandin. And I don't think Grandin had any particular doctrinal interest in it. Um, he, uh, of course, was not a believer, and uh, he was just earning money with his printing press. Uh, punctuation was also practically non-existent in the manuscript, and the typesetter is the one that usually that that and that again would be Grandin. So um, I'm not sure that the that we can depend on anything as being specifically related to da Oliver Cowdery and what his choices were, unless Oliver was the one to put the punctuation in. And Oliver did that in some cases, um, but we don't know when. It's kind of hard to look at punctuation and get a handwriting idea. Who done it? It just kind of depends upon um, what language you're talking. If we were talking German, capitalization would make a whale of a difference. All nouns are capitalized in German. But of course, it was English that we were using here. So I don't think that uh, there's anything that we can have that's theological about that. After all, we know, uh, we who believe in the Book of Mormon, 
that the disciples of Jesus' day, we know them as the apostles. We know their names from the New Testament. And I believe we know most of the names of the disciples from Jesus' day from through Nephi. So we know they refer to the same 24 specific individuals. So I don't think it has anything to do with the general concept of discipleship. And I think that any looking for any meaning in that from the original intent of Oliver and Joseph and so on is not there. I don't think there's anything like that. That's just my opinion. But that's, uh, I thought I wanted to share that. Uh, sure. Th thanks for that, Blair. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not so much um, an original intent person. I'm, I'm not, I'm not convinced we can know what authorial intent is. And so for me, I have to construct all of that out of the text. And the patterns that I saw led me to wonder what the evolution of the capitalization was in the manuscripts. And, and I think you hit it dead on. I and, think and, you hit it dead on. Oliver uh, found that change and he decided, well, he was going to go with them with the change. You don't go back and print, reprint all those pages. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. So, so, I mean, it, it, it if, if it's reasonable, and I mean, normally I'm, I'm dealing just with narratives and literary issues. I don't delve into issues of history much or historical reconstruction. But if it is reasonable to assume that Disciple was always capitalized in the original manuscript, it seems to me that literarily um, there may be some theological emphasis that the text would reveal regardless of the intent of the author or the scribes. And so I'm not, I'm not making claims that would suggest we don't know who the apostles are or the disciples for that matter. To me, it's kind of a literary, um, there are literary implications. And that's how I, uh, that's how I would try to work through New Testament texts. Although, you know, as you may well know, uh, the whole notion of disciple being capitalized or not is a non-issue in Greek. Uh, and so, but no, I appreciate, I appreciate your observations, Blair, and the feedback on, on Oliver, perhaps following uh, Gilbert uh, or Grandin's practice at that point. Yeah. Um, and it's always, you know, one of the things that forums like this are nice for me is I don't have a whole lot of people in my neck of the woods to talk to about Book of Mormon issues. And my off the beaten path kind of approaches means that their dialogue partners are few and far between. So I'm very appreciative that you would take the time to respond to that and make those observations. Thanks so much. Thank you. But you, just as a, uh, I mentioned this, Chris, when you were here before, but I do think, Chris Ambler, that the uh, the disciples, or if we're thinking the apostles, they're not only important individually, they're also important as a corporate group. And in both the New Testament and the Book of Mormon, they're set up as judges, uh, last judgment judges as a group. So that's actually a pretty important theological, that their corporate existence is theologically important in both the Old, uh, New Testament and the Book of Mormon. Yeah, I would agree with you, Val. 
as a believer, I would agree with Val. Yeah, and I, I recall, Val, that, that uh, uh, point of which I made uh, copious notes. Uh, alas, I am not in my office and have not had time to go back and work back through that. But you made two or three observations that, that I want to, to continue to think with. Uh, or think about. So th thanks for that. For those of you that have not been on the previous session, I need to clarify that Christopher Thomas is the author of the Pentecostal Reads the Book of Mormon. And when he talks about being somewhat marginalized in terms of having an audience of people to talk with who, have, who are comparable, not that many Pentecostals have read the Book of Mormon apparently. And so uh, he has to find uh, people who have read it are willing to be interested in his research among people like us. So I thank you so very much, uh, John, for for uh, joining us again and and sharing this uh, this review episode. Blair, are we going to get a chance to get the review on yours now? Well, so Blair, Blair, uh, I will not be able to get your PowerPoint downloaded in time to present it this evening. It's too big for me. <laughs> Maybe that's my problem. <laughs> no, um, I'm 91 years old and I'm in the old last century, 20th century. So doing all this technical stuff boom boggles my brain. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I would like to have presented it, but uh, I just don't don't know how to do it. <laughs> well, well, I can tell you basically without without any pictures that this book, the discovery of Genesis. is written by a fellow by the name of C.H. Kong. He is a Chinese Christian missionary, and it's co-written by Ethel Nelson. And the, the concept of the book is that within the Chinese characters of today, the writing has remained so consistent over the last uh, about 3,000 years that the characters carry meaning and that within those characters is meaning that relates to the book of Genesis, which wasn't written till about over 2,000 years after these kind of characters were developed. And that the Christian message is in the Bible, is in the Chinese writing that they read every day and do not recognize. This character right here, for example, means to create and it is formed from four basic characters one of them means to give life that's this one right here to give life the next is one that represents dust to give life to dust the symbol here is for walking, and the symbol here is a mouth for talking. And the word to create really means to give life to dust, walking and talking. And the whole book is related to other characters that show that relationship. And this is a Christian message that came long before Abraham in the writing system. Sorry, I couldn't uh, 
make that presentation, folks. And let me ask, uh, let me call attention to the fact that the previous presentation on the Jaredites moving through China and leaving the eight different cities of Xi'an. Yes. Uh, there's an interesting corollary with what you presented here. So, well, I don't think we made that connection previously. I think it is an important one to make that uh, if you're right on the on the Jaredite migration going through China, influencing Chinese history, then there is a possible explanation for your um, yes. for accounts there. I think that connection is there, that it's the Chinese. The Chinese are remnants of the Jaredite migration, people who just didn't go any further because they found their Zion, Xi'an. I think it all fits together. Okay, there you have it. We want to go to the... Uh... The reaction is down at the bottom of your screen. You can raise your hand and turn over to Doug to try and keep the queue in line. Well, I'm usually the one that comes up with the first question, but since I'm one of the presenters tonight, then I, I'm going to defer. <laughs> Don't everybody jump at once. Um, isn't it interesting, though, that here we have three presentations that we're reviewing, one on the capital letter D, one on the Old Testament in China, and one on pondering in our hearts. What, a, what an interesting uh, uh, eclectic collection of ideas we have working in the, in the forum. Well, I want to say that I think that probably all of us in this forum ponder such things. We don't all come to the same kind of conclusions, but I think we're all honestly pondering and seeking for truth. Now, I would like to uh, talk to uh, the, what was her name that was on last week? Laura. Uh, Laura. What's that? Laura Hathaway? Uh, yes. You see, I live in the area of the Patuxent River where she said Zarahemla was. As a matter of fact, the little ravine out behind my house here drains into the little Patuxent River, which I would call the headwaters of the Patuxent, or some of the headwaters of the Patuxent River. And she thinks that uh, Zarahemla was on the Patuxent River. I was fascinated by uh, how she was describing the area where I live. <laughs> and uh, yet, I call these the headwaters of the Patuxent River because I've got a drainage pond across the street from me that drains down into that ravine. That ravine feeds down into the Little Patuxent River. The Little Patuxent River feeds into the Middle Patuxent River, which goes on down into the Patuxent River, where she thinks Sarah Hamla was. However, I think of this as the headwaters, and she thinks that the water somehow headwaters were flowing up the other way to get a south to north direction, and I do not understand that geography. <laughs> but she's not here to talk to about. I didn't understand, but I. But it sounds like though you live above the fall line. 
Anyway. No, what she said is the fall line is at the northern point of the Chesapeake Bay. And I am down on the, um, well, it's just between Baltimore and Washington, D.C. The Patuxent River begins, I believe, up in Pennsylvania. Uh, when, no, no, it's a uh, Mount Airy area, due west of, uh, due west of Baltimore on Highway uh, Interstate 70. And uh, that's one of the, the beginning points. And it, the whole drainage from there and from this area runs down into that Patuxent River. The Potomac River is south of us, and it flows through Washington, D.C. area, divides Virginia and Maryland. But the Patuxent River is cuts right through here. I'm at the headwaters of this branch of the Patuxent River. She has yet to write the uh, account and give us a chance to give it critical acclaim, but uh, or to be so courageous as to present. And even though we don't, didn't get a complete understanding, I appreciate that we now have six different representations of where the land of Nephi was that uh, we've seen in our forum, and uh, and none have been totally expelled. Matter of fact, I think each of them has gained a few converts. <laughs> Fascinating for me to see how these different perspectives seem to support uh, the, the amalgam of an understanding of people in quest of the promised land. I kind of still remain in the Mesoamerica concept. I can't see the flat land or the headland, the heartland, Delmarva. Malaysia. It's too much of a description of what is in the United States area to me. That is in the Western Hemisphere. Of course, most of those are. You got one out of Africa, you got one out of Malaysia that are not related. Go as far south as Peru, I think, is absurd. <laughs> but that's my opinion. Well, we welcome your opinion, and we welcome the opinion of others as well. And we agree to try to do so, uh, do our discussions uh, amicably, so that even though we disagree, we do so amicably as well. Roger. And that makes us of one mind, even if we don't agree. <laughs> so I, have some unity. I, I was intrigued, particularly by the, the small area of uh, land that, that she was able to put the Book of Mormon in. Um, and I'm intrigued by the, the melee thesis because it does a good job of highlighting the plants and the animals better than any of the others, I think. And uh, yeah, I have a I I have a predisposition toward the Mesoamerican one because I spent uh, my some of my growing up my college years there and it uh, it well and the simple fact that we have Lamonai and I grew up in Lamonai or near Lamonai and that's a place where a king of peace and therefore there's a strong corollary for my life to to be affectionately tied to Lemonai and uh, Bevis, a Maya site of apparently pe peaceful people surrounded by sites that are, that are fortified. So anyway, I'm talking too much here. We should yield to the people who raise their hands. But it's uh, <laughs> We don't have any yet, Paul. <laughs> Deb, what's happened to us that our people aren't raising their hands? 
I don't know if the reaction button is broke, Paul. I don't know. <laughs> Somebody raise your hand just so I can make sure my button ain't broke. <laughs> There you go, Chris. <laughs> Thank you. And Rick. All right. Hi, Robert. Okay, the button works. <laughs> well, we have all of these former presenters that uh, I would think would have questions and comments, and I certainly encourage that. Uh, we are at this stage and really for the fat lady to see. Well, I just feel bad that uh, I missed Chris's presentation when he gave it, and then I came in late today and I didn't get to hear it again. So <laughs> I'm going to have to go back to the archives and get it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I did listen to uh, um, Laura Hathaway's today, though, um, since that was fresh uh, in my email that Robert sent, so that was nice. And she did share last week when she was uh, discussing with us that it's only the second time she's presented and your podcast was the first. Yeah, yeah. I, I knew that. I appreciated the shout out at the beginning. So that was nice. Oh, James Lucas. Yay. Go ahead, James. Okay. Um, as long as we kind of uh, have a very open-ended uh, piece of time here. Uh, when Paul had uh, was preparing his presentation, he and I had some conversation about illustrating the concepts that he was putting in his presentation with a uh, specific geography example. Um, so I kind of it, it didn't really develop uh, enough to be part of his presentation, uh, but um, as long as we, we have um, uh, a little bit of free time here, I maybe would throw that out and ask Paul if it does or does not fit into the framework that he was uh, presenting. And uh, this the specific example that I had uh, suggested to him was the question of Lehi's route to America. So, uh, at least among uh, believers uh, in the Book of Mormon, there's a pretty, I think, uh, substantial consensus across the board about uh, the Book of ne First Nephi describing a journey through the Arabian Peninsula. You know, there's a lot of markers. There's Nahum. There's the description of Bountiful, which corresponds to the uh, well-watered uh, uh, areas on the Indian coast of uh, the Arabian Peninsula. Indian Ocean coast of, uh, of the uh, of Arabia and so forth, but then uh, you basically have um, <clears throat> you know the the route splits in two there, um, the uh, more traditional advocates argued for a, a, a crossing across the Pacific Ocean, um, and uh, with a. Uh, this was particularly a strong view amongst uh, advocates of a Mesoamerican geography, um, because that could put uh, uh, the Lehigh uh, uh, party or uh, expedition onto the coast of uh, the Pacific coast of Central America, from which they've created. There's a variety, of course, Mesoamerican geographies, and it also was favorable to the South American uh, model and also uh, the Baja California model. Uh, but more recently, um, uh, uh, the suggestion has been proposed of a route which leaves from the Arabia and instead of going uh, west with the winter monsoons, I think I'm getting that seasons right, um, across the Pacific, uh, a route that went south with the spring monsoons along the coast of Africa, around Africa, and then across the Pacific Ocean um, to uh, uh, North America. I mean, not the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean to America. And um, the uh, while this route has been 
promoted and advocated by uh, 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 advocates of the heartland geography. Uh, I pointed out to Paul that the trade winds that are the uh, basis of this model, the transatlantic model, uh, that would uh, basically um, across the northern southern Atlantic, in other words, uh, basically uh, across from North Africa, there's strong uh, flows of both currents and trade winds uh, running from uh, the north of Africa to the middle of the Americas. In other words, uh, and this is the route that Columbus took and then that everybody else took. And um, uh, this is uh, what our, uh, our hero, Philip Beale, took with his replica 6th century BC Phoenician boat um, to show that uh, uh, a, a sailing vessel of the 6th century BC could indeed make it across the Atlantic uh, from uh, Europe or the Eurasia to America. And so anyway, I pointed out to Paul that while the, um, you know, this particular uh, route was promoted by the uh, advocates of the heartland, it would, um, uh, you know, putting um, the uh, <clears throat> Lehigh party uh, onto an initial uh, landing in Florida or sometimes Louisiana uh, to go up the Mississippi. And I would note that it would also be compatible with this Delmarva, this new Delmarva geography, um, because the uh, uh, when you sail across on that route along the uh, southern Atlantic trade winds, you then can very easily uh, get into the Gulf Stream, uh, which would then carry you north to uh, landings uh, anywhere along the East Atlantic coast of North America, which would include the Chesapeake Bay. Um, but I pointed out to Paul that those same trade winds could carry you into the Southern Caribbean also, and that um, you... Uh, uh, you know, you could very well uh, uh, use this uh, argument of a trans around Africa and transatlantic crossing to get your people to the Caribbean coast of Central America, which, uh, you know, depending on how rigid your Mesoamerican model is as far as uh, uh, identifying particular geographic locations, uh, you know, would get your people, your Lehi uh, and his party, uh, very close to uh, the Mesoamerican, you know, areas, um, including, uh, uh, um, but you just have to adjust your geography to account for an initial landing on the uh, Caribbean coast of Central America rather than the uh, Pacific coast of Central America. And so I was proposing, suggesting to Paul that this might be an example of some synergy of uh, bringing together the uh, disparate and rather contentious geographic models, at least to the point of uh, perhaps some consensus on the route to the Americas uh, that the Lehigh's took. Because if in fact the um, Mesoamerican advocates and the North American advocates could agree on a route of the Lehigh party all the way into the Caribbean or into the uh, uh, waters of, uh, of the uh, uh, Gulf of Mexico or the Americas uh, from Arabia around Africa and across uh, the Atlantic, that would add, uh, you know, what, what 10,000 miles to the consensus of that had already been developed about the Lee Heights route through the Arabian Peninsula. And you know, wouldn't that be nice to have a point of agreement between the Mesoamerican advocates and the uh, North American advocates? And so I was suggesting that you know uh, that that might be a, uh, an example of this sort of bringing things together and trying to find synergies, uh, which uh, in a very specific way, which uh, Paul was uh, outlining in his presentation. So sorry to give a long lecture, but. Uh, this is my occasion to ask Paul is, uh, is uh, whether he thinks this particular specific kind of uh, factual or, you know, uh, argument um, is indeed an example of what he was describing, or if uh, 
this is really kind of off base to the kind of concepts that he was laying out. Well, let me tongue in cheek, first of all, acknowledge that uh, that's the lawyer question. Um, <laughs> <either> or. <laughs> However, <laughs> the basis of understanding behind that is so interesting and so uh, comprehensive that I do want to address the whole issue where normally I would uh, just simply avoid a yes or no question. But uh, since he has given you the background to understand that, let me add to I, I got up looking for the Vernila Simmons uh, book. Uh, she is one who identified the, uh, the route for uh, the Ulekites as being from Phoenicia and the Chantal Maya. And by the way, I just had the chance this last weekend to meet a lady who, whose origin was in the Chantal Maya. And uh, she didn't know much about her background, and so I was excited to share a little bit with her because the uh, the Chantal Maya were the travelers; they were the canoeists. They they connected the Maya all across Central America by their large canoes that they hauled out of the mahogany trees and and used to transport goods from the northern Maya to the to the southern, all the way around the Yucatan Peninsula, and they also had the unique trait of being able to extract purple dye from seashells, a trait that's only otherwise known among the Phoenicians. And so to be able to suggest that uh, at least that Phoenician route coming to the Americas could, yes, could have landed in Florida, probably did, and maybe Chesapeake. And you see, we, we have a hard time tracing those uh, paths across the water. And when we try to look at uh, where they started and where they ended and try to make connections, then there's an awful lot of options by which we can mess up. But at least we're looking at options. And when we begin to look at more options, it isn't just a yes or no anymore. It's really, there's a whole bunch of possibilities here. And so, yes, absolutely, James, the prospect of being able to get us to think together and uh, share together the best information we have. So much more needs to be learned about the currents, or how much of the currents changed, and uh, to what extent our, our, our culture, our, to what extent are we influenced by those changes? The question of crossing the Pacific, crossing the Atlantic um, by, by Lehi and his people. Yes, I think we generally have agreement that the, that the Arabian Peninsula is the is well marked. I think what uh, George Potter has done there has been quite convincing. You know, I think some 80 spots identified sequentially in the Book of Mormon story. And so that is a, a very uh, compelling study. But then from the Arabian Peninsula, yeah, you can go east or west. And depending upon the season, depending upon the nature of your vessel, then it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a challenge in the case because so long ways across that big wet. At the same time, it's clear that people did it. And while we've been talking about the Book of Mormon peoples and starting about uh, 4,000 years ago, it's clear that we have people doing it perhaps as much as 40,000 years ago. And so the more you start looking into this, then the more we need to pull our minds together and consider all of our options and consider all of our perspectives because I believe that, that by doing so, if, if nothing, nothing else, we at least learn more. And by learning more, we do uh, sort of a better prospect. Well, that's that pondering. And when we ponder in our hearts and ponder in our heads and get those to, to work together, then yes, I believe that is the, the direction. That, that's the direction of these Book of Mormon Perspectives Forum. And I would hope it's the direction that focus toward the cause of Zion. So thank you for bringing that comment because absolutely on target. And yes, uh, I, I I think that there's a tremendous amount of prospect and benefit for us to be able to share together. And and even though we may not agree, uh, among other things, to me it begins to to uh, really confirm the idea that the Book of Mormon is among other things an allegory of the dysfunctional human family that has been seeking a promised land and failing at it for an awful long time, and perhaps occasionally having some success, particularly when we learn the, to teach the, the lessons of 
the teachings of Christ. You see, the Book of Mormon tells us that's that's a good way to have a success. There may be others. I think uh, to appreciate that Christ went to see the other sheep, and we haven't bothered to pay attention to what their traditions tell us. And I think their scriptures probably can inform us more. Their traditions inform us more. But as colonialists, we have not been very good at listening, and mm. we need to be able to reconsider that for the remnants that are left. So to have people like the Rainbow Eagle with us tonight, hope he's still with us. Yeah, he's still here. Um, to have to have his his uh, educated perspective and well and, and well um, exposed perspectives of, of the First Nations peoples, the Aboriginal peoples, forty nations he's visited to talk with the Native peoples to be able to pull their prophecies and their understanding together. We really need that kind of thing. Give the microphone to the people who have been marginalized to the point that we pay no attention to them, and we can learn an awful lot from them as we go. One of the benefits of having married Tegro to Rina Paura was it gave me another cultural perspective that um, made it so that while I am from the greatest civilization the world there has ever seen, I appreciate hers more than mine in many respects. Okay. Didn't, didn't mean to put you on the spot with an either or question. I was just asking if that was a, a good illustration of what you were trying to uh, explain. But I didn't mean to insult you by by <laughs> lawyer. On the other hand, there's a natural implicit uh, training that you have as a lawyer to use those questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Rick has a question. Go ahead, Rick. Not so much a question as just to echo what Jim said. I'm, uh, I've never been a real fan of Heartland, but um, with my interview with Philip Beale, and I don't know, Paul, he would be great to get on. You know, he's in England and the time zone might be different, but he really convinced me of uh, Atlantic is the only way to go. Because um, I even quizzed him on what about the Pacific? And and like Jim said, it's twice the distance, the winds against you, the currents against you, the Atlantic is the way to go. And so um, he may be a Rick, believer. Didn't you, didn't you specifically ask him if the uh, Atlantic route could take you into the Southern Caribbean as well as up into the North? I think. Yeah, I did. He did say that you would have to know where you were going to get there, but yes, it is possible. So so it, it is even compatible with a Central American hypothesis. Now, Baja, I think that's a little bit problematic. Um, Sri Lanka. <laughs> Sri Lanka is <clears throat> half the distance. If I, you know, that's a, that's a, that was a new theory I, I just found about, and I was just like, oh, that's kind of crazy. Um, but uh, yeah, I really think if, if you're looking at anything in the America, Peru, I'm actually trying to get uh, George Potter on because he's the only South America expert I know. And I don't know if you guys got the email that I just got. Um, he, you know, he sends out a newsletter called the Nephi Project. And uh, just a week or two ago, it said, this is the last newsletter I'm retiring. And so I immediately sent him an email and said, does that mean you're going to be in Utah more? And he said, yeah, because he's, you know, he's been working in Saudi Arabia for a couple decades. And so he's going to be spending more time here. Um, and uh, anyway, so I've been looking for a South America expert for a long time. I, I, you know, being on the West Coast of South America, and I don't know George's particular theory, uh, I mean, there's a there's a theory that it, that South America was mostly flooded, um, but the problem is it's off by like a million years. I don't remember a hundred thousand years or a million years or something like that. Um, so the time frame's off. So it's going to make Peru very difficult uh, from from the Atlantic Ocean. But uh, anyway, so just wanted to echo what Jim said. I I totally agree with everything he said. We have had George on a couple of times, and uh, and I'd like to get him back again. Uh, in fact, I invited him back uh, this spring, and he was not available. 
Right? Yeah. Right. He's, he's, he's doing a lot of traveling in August, but uh, I'm going to contact him at the end of August and see if I can get him on there. I've been trying to get a South America guy for a long time, and I think George is going to be my guy. He uses the Lake Titicaca for the West Sea, and and he has some really strong um, positives to support his theory in the architectural constructions of the early cities there, because he has some of the very so some of the interesting parallels between Caracol and other Inca uh, um, uh, cities with the kind of construction that we find in the Middle East. And because uh, because he's studied the architecture there, and in both places, then those, those connections are particularly fascinating to me. And the fact that he has some of the earliest uh, urban centers in the, in, the, in the two Americas uh, in Peru makes that another more viable candidate. And then I will say just to, add on there. Uh, his Middle Eastern stuff, I think, is excellent. I was really surprised because, you know, it seems like the BYU guys kind of go with because there's a there's two different um, sites for Nephi's Harbor, and uh, the Astons have one, Cor Rory, and I think George Potter has Cor Food, or I might have the names backwards. But anyway, I was really surprised that uh, Brant Gardner, who's more who I would call a BYU guy, <laughs> was like, yeah, I think George Potter's right. And I was like, oh, wow. So, yeah, I mean, he's, yeah, he's really good with that stuff. I, I question his South, well, we'll see. I haven't questioned him yet, but we'll, I'll, I'll question him, see if he can convince me on South America. <laughs> Looks like Terry's up. Yeah, Terry's turn. I have a question for Rick. Uh, does Rick Halk work with George or vice versa? Do you know who Rick Hauk is? I don't know who Rick Hauk is, no. Uh, Rick Hauk was at BYU when I did, but he's done some work in Arabia and uh, has named sites from, from there that have similar names in the Book of Mormon. And so I don't know if he oh. does the same stuff as George Potter or what. I wonder if Rick Houck works with the uh, Astons. Um, I know George works with a guy named Timothy Sidor. Uh, I see Tim's name everywhere on George's newsletters. Um, but And I, I'm vaguely familiar with, I, I've got the Astons book, but it's been a long time since I read it. And I don't know if I remember the name Houck in there. It could be in there. I don't know. Okay, I'll just have to trace it down. So thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Since nobody's talking, I'm going to put Paul on the spot. Um, Paul, I know Hans Mill isn't really related to Book of Mormon, but uh, Cheryl sent me an advanced copy. I'm excited. <laughs> I need to get reading it. So I need to interview you, Paul. Well, I have scheduled the presentation on it twice because uh, back in May, we were assured it would be out any day. And uh, I had hoped to be able to sell it at the reunions that I attended. That's spectacular. And, and I still haven't received a copy myself. Um, oh, well, yeah, I got the, I got a PDF. Um, I prefer paper, <laughs> but, but in, in a pinch, I'll take a PDF. <laughs> so, we, we and, I can send it to you, Paul, if this isn't being recorded. <laughs> I, I We're still being recorded, Rick. Uh, I know. <laughs> so, 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 Rick, give us the quick uh, preview. Have you, well, have you read that's it yet? Literally, <laughs> Cheryl emailed me at midnight. I was still up, and I was like, yeah, I'll take a copy, and she sent it right away. But I, I, all it did was open the attachment, save it um, in my... Paul DeBarth folder for a future interview, <laughs> but I haven't, I don't even, I, I think I barely looked at the cover. I, I, that's all I know, so. Well, you're ahead of me. I haven't seen the cover yet. <laughs> well, let me make sure I have a cover. We had a, we had a, 
If I can get an advanced copy, I'm sure I can forward it to you, Paul. I, I have a link. I I was copied in the one that was sent to you. So, but I have. Oh, you were oh, okay. I, I, but I haven't opened it. You haven't opened it either. You're, you're as bad as me. I I understand from Mike Briggs, however, that he opened it and found that the references were missing. And no. uh, that's another ten pages or so on top of a couple hundred that are already there. Where yeah. is it? Episode where we discovered the about fifty page. Oh. Page. I started to download it and I actually didn't because I was on the wrong computer. I, I, you'll notice my the angle looks funny. I've got a computer on my lap and a computer on my couch. And uh, I started to download it and then I was like, oh, I'm on the wrong computer. I can't put it on this computer. So I'll look for it. Where is it? The, the Book of Mormon connection there is more uh, as we relate Mormonism. Uh, and the perception of the Book of Mormon by Missourians as the Mormons came in and tried to establish their Zion independence in a state that in 1820 was in the United States as a slave state. And to have a slave state uh, with the slave owners fundamentally in charge of the politics, then the intrusion in 1831 or 1833 of a bunch of people establishing an, an equitable city and in independence. And uh, W. Doug Phelps, who I respect in many respects, uh, did a pretty good job of representing the church views, but he didn't bother to publish anything about the Missourian views and, and antagonized them to the point mm -hmm. that they impressed. So here, one of my, my one of the conversations I want to have is to encourage people to help us write the other chapters about the LDS printing, because we're writing the fourth chapter this year on Times and Seasons 2, but uh, to be able to tell the story of the uh, LDS printing in Independence, Kirtland, Far West, and then the Nauvoo is uh, a complex that I think we really ought to do the archaeology on and, and get written as part of the legacy we need for the future. But in terms of, of the Book of Mormon connections in our book, it's fundamentally the simple fact that the whole idea of the Book of Mormon was officially offensive to slave owning Missourians, that um, they didn't want anything to do with it. And it was just one of the antagonisms that uh, contributed to the Mormon War. Okay. Well, yeah, you are right that there's no, uh, there's an index though. That's cool. There's no references, but yeah, it's, and it's only 200 pages, so. Um, yeah, with the, with the uh, references, it should be in 210 or 12 pages, something like that. Oh, and you got pictures in the back. I love pictures. Uh, <laughs> Appendix A. So you're only about 180 pages. That's not bad. <laughs> All right, well, there's a lot of pictures of the students, and my hope is the students will discover it and want to buy it. Yeah. And well, like uh, we can work out an interview time. Um, you are going to Whitmer, right? Yes. We should get a raise of hands. Who's going to Whitmer besides me and Paul? Deb, Robert. Y'all need to come. Yeah. I'm speaking, by the way. I'm speaking twice. <laughs> People coming up, speakers. So that must mean you're bringing all your gear again, huh? Well, if I can get an interview with Paul and because Michael Riggs will be there too, right? If his new position with uh, FEMA allows him, he will. Oh, so he might not be there? Right now it's questionable because he has just uh, completed an interview that should have him in an administrative position by then, but uh, that, that means that well, he's already put in the request for having that uh, weekend available uh, and for hopefully for FEMA to, to uh, pay for his trip. Nonetheless, uh, it's uncertain because he doesn't yet have the position. Okay. Well, hopefully I can get both of you, um, but I'll just take Paul if I have to. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get you in there. 
If you want if you want rigs for the history part, you want me for the archaeology part. Okay. Yeah. Although with some of the history, the the convergence between the the uh, the trail of the Kirtland people down what now we call Highway 24 and the uh, Potawatomi we were driven out of Indiana in 1838 and uh, and they, they missed, well, they, they camped at the same spots in, in, on occasion, uh, about three weeks apart. But by the time we get to the Hans Mill in October of 1838, the Potawatomi would have been about Independence, Missouri. And the Potawatomi had left almost 100 people dead behind them on that trail. And so they've been marking, there have been some efforts to mark where those kids are, uh, because many of them were children. And, uh, to me, it's a fascinating corollary to see that the uh, the rather harsh treatment of the Mormons and the harsh treatment of, of the Native Americans went hand in hand, at least at the same time, across the state of Missouri in 1838. Oh, wow. I think that's one of the elements that few people will recognize, but uh, to me, it's important because I, I I just discovered that, that we had in my in my area of southern Iowa, we had a honey war between the Missourians and the Iowans in the 1830s that was fundamentally uh, brought about because Governor Lilliburn Boggs sent a tax collector up into northern Missouri to collect the taxes because he knew there were at least six good honey honey producing trees that uh, were producing more than a dollar's worth of honey every year. And so he had to collect the taxes on that. So he sent a tax collector to, to collect the taxes on that honey. And the tax collector went back without any taxes, complaining that the people said they were in Iowa, they were not in Missouri. Well, that dispute, because there was a 13 mile border area where some Missourians with slaves were, were moving up into that area because Missouri was claiming it. But the Iowa claim uh, reached the uh, the boundaries that were set in 1838. And so all, they, they actually, the governor of Iowa and the governor of Missouri each put together a, a militia of, of a thousand, I think it was a thousand, twelve hundred in Iowa and 1500 in Missouri that prepared to fight the honey war to, uh, to, to win that, win those six honey trees. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> But uh, the federal troop, the federals came in and, and resurveyed, and so the survey established is today. And so they shot their guns and got drunk and enjoyed themselves a great deal. But I think nobody was killed in the honey war. Just uh, three, oh, the Missourians shot down three of the trees out of anger that uh, they won't be able to fight the back. <laughs> but anyway, mm -hmm. cool. I, I hadn't realized the governor Boggs had been involved in the war in my. Home County and Humboldt County. <laughs> Governor Boggs was a bad dude. <laughs> and well, what an earful you get if you're on the forum tonight, huh? <laughs> How does this relate to the Book of Mormon? <laughs> uh, well, Book of Mormon mentions honey. <laughs> right. We're short of hands raised tonight. Hey, there's finger raised by uh, Rainbow Eagle. Now, four, ten fingers. You're welcome to speak to us, sir. <laughs> oh, we've got a letter. Doing smoke signals. Mm -hmm. read, hand, uh, read sign. There he is. Hello, everybody. Hi. Uh, I'm. Uh, taking off tomorrow to drive about 12 hours into the mid uh, America. I'm going to be visiting my twin brother. I uh, also want to drop by and uh, see Paul. I sure. need a telephone number. I have your, your uh, address here, Woodland Park, no Overland Park. But Paul, I'd like to be able to call you so that I can drop in. And see ya. One three nine six three 
2177. And what's the first three? One, three. 913. 913, thank you. All righty. Yes. Let's... Thinking about. Uh, See if I can get in there about to, on Thursday sometime. So I'll give you a call, Paul. Hello, everybody. Hello. I like your pictures behind you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> How's Ralph doing? Well, it's quite a journey. It's uh, beginning to reach into some of his uh, cognitive uh, uh, faculties. Okay. He's finding out when he's writing, he's leaving out some of the letters. Oh. And that, of course, is not uh, easy to kind of get, get used to doing. <clears throat> yeah. Please let him know we miss him and tell him that we said hello, please. I always do that. You bet you that's the reason I come on. Thank I you. don't know uh, how to quite respond to everything that is uh, uh, being discussed, but it's uh, nice to be able to see everybody and uh, particularly be able to see Blair there. <clears throat> it's nice to uh, see some of the people that I've known over the years. Hi, Ralph. <clears throat> if we could plan dinner on Thursday evening, that'd be delightful. Thursday evening, I will give you a call and we'll see, see if we can make that happen. Uh, I, I, we have a really good First Nations uh, place called Bo Wings. Oh, no, I guess that's Chinese in it. Oh, well. <laughs> uh, all right, we'll figure out someplace to eat. Uh, Paul, watch your email. I've got a, uh, a request that I want to email you with. It's having to do with uh, some of the people that uh, want my book and the uh, jump drive. I want to find out <clears throat> who has... Uh, a PC and who has a Mac because the uh, jump drive needs to be uh, designed according to uh, either a PC or a Mac. So I need to have some, uh, some numbers uh, so that I can have that ready. Ooh. Yeah, I think I'm the only one with a Mac. Okay, that tells, tells me something. And <clears throat> yeah, I, well, you got debarthp at gmail.com and uh, I'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, need to, we'll need to make the adjustment on the others. Uh, I guess I should call them so you know what to bring. And uh, my number is he's looking for here it is 614 204 4365. 614 204 4365. Correct. Get okay. Good. Thank you. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, we are at quarter to 10 already. And, but Wednesday hasn't had a chance to speak yet. Oh, no, I don't have anything to say. I wasn't at a lot of these presentations, so it was nice to get a good overview of everything. Um, so, yeah, I appreciate it being here today. Hi, Rainbow Eagle. Yeah. Hi, the Lord is watching over you. Good night, his blessings go before you. Good night, and we'll be praying for you. So good night. May God bless you. Yeah, a picture of my sweetheart behind me. He normally would be singing, but 